Okay, now it's recording again. I, I apologize for that. Um, yeah, so if, if you could, um, everybody should know, you know, who, who I am, where I'm coming from at this point. So I'll let you go ahead and explain who you are and who you're coming from. And I, again, I apologize for having to do this a second time. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Jonathan Walters. I am an analyst by day and a amateur theologian and apologist and whatever other spare time I have. Um, been really getting into the study of theology probably since I was around 16 or so, and I'm a long way from 16 right now, so to say it's been a while. Um, as far as from the theological perspective I'm coming from would be Reformed Baptist. Um, I would adhere most closely to the 1689 London Baptist Confession as far as a theological statement. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I'm going to be coming from. All right, cool. Well, so just so everybody knows, um, you know, the, the enormous audience that there is, just so they know, um, we've had, you know, several discussions before. I don't know how many we actually did after that initial debate, how many discussions we had. Maybe three. I'd say three or four at least. Yeah, yeah something like that. Um, so if it, if we're at any point in the discussion, if, if we get to something that we've already kind of talked about before, if it, if it sounds like something that might be helpful to kind of re go through, hopefully we can do that. And that way nobody's left, you know, um, in the dark about the, the previous discussions we've had. Yeah. We've so, covered a lot of ground behind the scenes for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the first question then is, uh, what is morality? All right. So um, I looked up the dictionary definition just for fun. It says uh, principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior. I pretty much totally agree with that. I would just add in the interest of this discussion, defining what good and bad behavior are would be that what good and bad is would be objective. Um, it's not something that changes based on society's opinions or personal opinions or whatever. So what morality is doesn't change if you if you have a differing opinion about it. It's either moral or it isn't moral, objectively speaking. Okay. And then, uh, depending on how we've how we've worded this, I'm, I'm assuming you have an opinion on where it comes from. Absolutely. Um, I would say that morality comes from the character of God. Uh, either revealed to us in his word or through his own creation, because we are made in his image, we bear a certain natural revelation within us that gives testament to a morality. You don't have to have ever read the Bible to know that uh, if you see a baby abandoned in your front yard, the moral thing is not to leave it there to die, but to bring it in and keep it warm and call the authorities or something along those lines. Right, right. Um, but, uh, but either way, uh, whether it be through knowledge of the scriptures or through that sort of natural created knowledge within us, um, the source of that morality is the same. Okay. And then we'll certainly come back to that because I've got, I've got several thoughts on that. And then the last one is how do we make use of it? What's the what's the best way for us to, to move forward in, in light of the morality that we have? Well, I, I would say there's probably about infinite applications of that, um, but probably the most important and broad application to it is for us to understand that we have sinned before God and we do not meet the standards of righteousness that he has put forward. And as such, we're guilty before God, and we need access to forgiveness from God. And that's something that we get access to through the gospel, as laid out in Scripture. Um, a, apart from that, we would stand before our judge as being guilty. Um, so, and, and there's a passage of Scripture I'd like to read that's going to be relevant to this and to the rest of our discussion, I'm sure. Um, Romans 3 10 through 18 says, as it is written, no one is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless, and no one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive, the venom of asps is under their lips, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness, their feet are 
swift to shed blood, and in their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Um, in the context of that passage, that's talking about every single human, whether you're Jew or not Jew or you know, every race, every person on the earth is pretty much implicated under that. And so an understanding of what true right and wrong is would let us understand that we are wrong before God, and that's a serious problem that needs to be addressed with great urgency. Um, and, and I think that as we begin to ask questions about God's role in moral issues, we have to understand our condition before God, um, that we don't necessarily have the right to demand good things of God because we don't deserve those good things. And the fact that we do have many good things from God is because of his mercy. Um, none of us deserve mercy by definition of what mercy is. It's an undeserved thing. Um, but we can't complain because maybe some person gets more mercy than others. And when dealing with the problem of evil actions, we need to understand the foundation of the problem of evil is that we are evil. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the things you're saying there is it's, I've heard this uh, approach a few different ways. So is there at some point, do you think in, in, in someone's life that, this Romans verse then becomes true or is it just, it's true as soon as they're born? Um, I would say that this is something that's definitional of human experience. So if you are a human, you are in some ways under this, obviously there is a increasing culpability of, um, I mean, using their tongues to deceive is not something that really works if you can't talk right, yet. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the kind um, so, of thing I was thinking about as you were reading it. Because I'm a lot of people, it, it's sort of a mix. I've, with with the theists I've talked to, it's kind of half and half. And sort of half think that a lot of this stuff is just true regardless, you know, of, of how old. And others think, well, some of this is really only applicable once the the child reaches the point where he can commit this kind of yeah. of action. Right. And, and so that's where, um, and, and again, this kind of goes into, there's two different applications of this that we need to understand. And one is that um, as descendants of Adam, Adam was our representative. And so when he declared war on God effectively through his rebellion, all of his descendants were at war with God. Like that's, we all got to inherit that condition of being under sin. And it is exactly that parallel, which is why Jesus Christ and his representation of his people makes such a difference because as we are placed into Christ, we are now, we have a new representative that is not Adam Christ is called the second Adam, and so under Christ, we are now at peace with God. So there's a representation aspect of this um, where the sin of Adam and the sinfulness of all of mankind applies to everyone who is not in Christ because we're all in Adam by descent. And so that's something that um, may be a little bit theologically complex. We may need to spend some more time on that, but there's also the aspect of in being in that state, we also all commit sin from a very, very early age, um, where, you know, I remember one of the uh, first time I had to, I saw clear, open rebellion in my son. He was still in diapers and crawling around, and he was crawling up to a bookshelf, and I told him, no, you don't touch that book, and he looked at me, and he looked at the bookshelf, and he looked at me, and he looked at the bookshelf, and you could see the rebellion fermenting in his brain as he reached for that book. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he was disciplined. Um, but, but, the, uh, but like from that early age, the, there's, you know, there's sin and rebellion, and to whatever degree they can, they're very selfish creatures, those little ones. Um, so, so we you, love them anyway. But <laughs> you think that... that <laughs> that itself just the the uh in that instance is some kind of 
incarnation of this result from Adam's sin? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's one of many manifestations of the fact that we all as parents know we never had to teach our children to disobey us or to put themselves ahead of their siblings or to do any of that kind of stuff. Like, the, this isn't learned behavior. They already do that automatically. You never have to work with your kid on, look, stop sharing with your child, siblings so much, you know. Um, you got you, you got to look out for yourself at least a little bit. No, they know that already. They're already all about themselves. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think that that's a, you know, all sin, all rebellion, all selfishness and pride and all, and all that other stuff that comes out so much in those little ones before they, you know, mature enough to restrain it in some way. Um, it is all part of this. So you would call it like when, when you told him not to, how, how old was he at this point? Uh, I don't know. I mean, to, to the point where he was using crawling as his primary mode of, okay. of <laughs> transport. So <laughs> very, very. Young. So, but you're, you're pretty sure that he understood when you told him not to touch the book, he, he understood what you were saying. Oh yes. Oh yes. <laughs> and his... he definitely like the, the looking and the pausing, like there was definitely consideration going and he knew what no was. Right. He was definitely old enough to know, <laughs> like you can tell like we've had this no conversation about things before. And this is the first time I've seen him just like, look me in the eye and be like, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So, to you, is that sin? Yeah. What he did there was sin? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, going back to this um, morality um, being part of the character of God, that's, what, that's sort of the, the part I kind of wrote down here to, to go back to. Because we've, we've touched on this many times before. Um is if um, if we look at if if we say morality is part of the character of God, then doesn't that um, tell us then that and and again, you know this is going to be something we've talked about many times before, but I, I want to make sure that we cover it. <clears throat> doesn't that tell us then that claims of God's actions, would then not be in contradiction with our own moral conscience? Well, what do you mean? It's, I guess as far as when you say claims of God act, God's actions would not be in contradiction to our moral conscience. Yes, yeah, so if, if our moral conscience is the sort of perfect representation of the character of God, and then someone describes God taking an action, which would be a character in in contradiction with our moral conscience. So let's like, what's something you would say is sort of abjectly immoral. So I, any any simplest act you can think of that you would just say is, is immoral. Yeah. Um, I, so I think the easiest one to discuss would be murder, right? So I can't Mm -hmm. just go up and decide I want to kill you for your wallet. That would be immoral. Okay. So, so taking someone's life for no good reason, obviously murder, bends a little bit because there's there's some cases where it's necessary um let, let's try to think of something that it's not situational like that um you know like i said you, you say you know taking someone's life is wrong but then you say okay, what if they're getting ready to take someone else's life for no reason or they're getting ready to try to take my life or they're in the process of taking a life or they're you know then obviously the killing part changes you know, then it might be the moral thing to take someone's life in order to prevent them from doing something else. So you see what I'm saying? Right. Well, you just, you change this. I I said, I'm killing you for your wallet. And now, now I'm killing you to preserve the life of another person. So that's okay. So, so okay. Yeah. Sorry. I I, I forgot that part. Okay. So you're you're killing me for my wallet. Um, if someone says, okay, you know, God killed a person for their wallet. Right. We can say, okay, that, that's obviously if, if God, if, if our moral conscience is the reflection of God's moral character, then we can say, okay, that's, that doesn't work. Right. 
Right. I mean, I would I would have to immediately reject your hypothetical because I think that's silly. Obviously, but, I obviously mean, that's why I, that's why I wanted to use a different example. <laughs> when you said kill you yeah. for your wallet, I was like, okay, that's going to sound really weird. Um, yeah. So um, let's just say, um, 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 I'm trying to think of just a simple example of an immoral act. Um, well, we could just say killing someone for no reason. All right. All right. So then if we say, okay, someone tells you that God killed someone for no reason. We can, then I would reject the premise because God never does anything for no reason. You know, well, uh, you're, you're missing <laughs> the point of what I'm trying to do here. Um, no, no. Just as any more. Okay. So let's say, um, um, what's, what's it, what's a good example to get to this point? Um, um, Maybe instead of going through hypotheticals, it would be helpful to address a specific concern because. Well, th this is this is what it, I, I want to I want to get through this part first, because it's, yeah. it's the big disconnect that I have with this character of, of God's morality. So mm -hmm. um, it's it basically it works like this. And I know I've probably said something like this in our discussions before. If someone says that God's character is what our morality comes from, then my then that God is sort of defined as someone who would behave morally and my own way to the only way I have to know what's moral is my moral conscience. Right? So if we say my moral conscience comes from God's character, then someone says God did this thing, which is, you know, in direct opposition to your moral conscience, then I can then say, Okay, then it's it's not true. Right. So I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that that is because um, your moral conscience is not maybe, or your thinking through things about your moral conscience isn't maybe taking into account all of the variables that you that you are being presented with. So here's the example, right? Obviously, when it comes to killing, we have and, and kind of borrowing from some of your discussions with your, you know, that I listened to before where you're going through these questions, you, you would bring up um, conquest issues, right, where God says go and kill all these people, including children or, or whatnot, where we would look at that. And on some level, we would say, hey, I don't like the idea of, you know, like now we would consider this a war crime or we would consider this to be wrong and and even i would be against our president saying go and attack the taliban and wipe out their villages men women and children and everything else and and everyone would say that's immoral to do that and so then we see god doing that in the old testament that's the, sort of the thing that you're getting at well that's that's one of the the things that can be discussed about that framework but i just <clears throat> Uh, that's why I wanted to discuss, more generally. It, discuss it beforehand. That way, you know, we've we've clarified the the where we're at when we approach those things. Right. So so the biggest distinction that I think that I would draw on some of these issues where we see God doing things which he might even forbid of us to do would be that there's issues of authority that need to be considered. So, um, in Deuteronomy thirty two thirty nine, it says, See now that I, even I am he, there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. There is none that can deliver out of my hand. So, God is saying there that he's got the authority over life and death. That's not something that I have, right? Like, um, it's interesting. I was, I don't know. I, I was just watching, um, I was watching Lord of the Rings with my kids and, and they're going through the minds of Moria and Gandalf is sitting with um, Frodo and, and discussing why Bilbo didn't just kill Gollum because Gollum has been following them. And mm. I don't know if you, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan or I've, saw I, that scene. I haven't seen that part in a long time. I've, I've watched all the Lord of the Rings movies, but I haven't seen yeah, that yeah. part in a long time. But but it was interesting because because Gandalf basically says you know, um, Bilbo basically says hey or or uh, rather, 
Frodo says to Gandalf, you, you know, the Gollum deserved to die. And Gandalf said, no doubt that he did. Many who live deserve death and many who die deserve life. Can you give it to them? So don't be so quick to, to hand out death and judgment because even the wise can't see all ends. Well, the, the framework there is, is, I think, is really insightful because he's saying, look, you don't have control over life and death. So maybe don't be so quick to deal out death because you sure can't deal out life. You don't think anybody has like so if, if someone goes and kills somebody, they don't they're not exercising the ability to take a life. Oh, no. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that we don't like obviously we do have the <clears throat> ability to kill people. But do we have the ability to give life to those who die that shouldn't? Right. That that's outside of our purview. And so, you know, what we do with life, we need to do cautiously and we need to do within the framework of authority that God has presented to us. And I would say if you study what God's word has to say on this issue, that framework is within the preservation of life. Like if you come into uh, my house, I will introduce you to God directly. (laughs) <laughs> um, and I will do so quickly before you harm my Hopefully, family. Hopefully, like if, that... <laughs> if I was with your intent, right? Not just I, 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 I'm not, not an invitation, but yes, if you break into my house and you just come in with, yes, with ill intent, then yes, I, I have no problem um, in arranging a very fast meeting between you and God. Um, but that's something that is within a certain framework that I'm not going to be doing that out on the street just because somebody looked at me funny. Mm-hmm. Um, or even someone that I believe has done something wrong, it is not within my purview of authority to carry out an execution upon that person, right? Like I can't be um, some kind of punisher that goes out there and, and takes vengeance with my gun and my anger and, and goes out and kills all the mean gangsters, right? That. That is not something that is within my authority to do, so that would be wrong. Um, so, you, so you would be against execution? No, because I'm not the government. So, so the government does have. There's that. a different level of authority that God has given to. God has given the government, governmental authorities, the sword to carry for the punishment of evildoers. And there's a framework within God's law that if someone is guilty of murder, the punishment is supposed to be a life for life. So there's absolutely a framework in which, like, yeah, I'm in favor of the death penalty. I'm not in the favor of vigilantes going out there and dishing that out, because they are not within the authority structure to do that. There are God-ordained authorities that have the right to actually take life to a greater degree than what I would, personally, as an individual citizen. So what makes makes them what makes them how would you know that that government was God ordained? Um, because the exactly. Bible says that all governments are God ordained. All of them. Yes, and and when Paul wrote that the the uh, the Roman government, which spent the next three hundred years um, abusing and and killing Christians, was in charge. So if he says that of them, then yes, all of yeah, them. That's, that's that's definitely a weird. Um, we've not we've not discussed that before. I, I didn't I didn't realize that was a part of this. So even even uh, um, like the current government in Afghanistan is a God ordained government, and whoever they decide to put to death, that's that's fine because they're a God ordained government. Not necessarily. So again, governments have certain authorities to also obey God's law. So if they just start killing Christians because they don't believe in Islam or something like that which is kind of what they're doing, then they're going to have to stand before God and answer to the way that they've used the authority that God has allowed them to have. Um, so that's that it. And that may be getting a little bit too far afield for where we want to go with this discussion. Cause yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's certainly legal theory yeah, within. And, it's, it's and certainly a new just, topic. It's, it's, it's yeah, one we hadn't law. discussed before. That's, that's why it interested me. I, I just, yeah, we hadn't got on that and I've, I've never heard that sort of all governments are God ordained so they can 
they can well again because i believe because i believe that god is sovereign and god can raise up kings and he can depose kings and he can lift up a government and he can tear down a nation um it doesn't mean that all those nations are righteous it doesn't mean that the decisions that they make are valid um if god chooses to raise up an evil government as a judgment against people or or to accomplish his purposes in some way in the world then that's something that we acknowledge he has the power and ability to do that he we repeatedly see him doing that during the times of scripture and and that's a whole other study that would take far beyond the hour or so that we have yeah, here yeah. to, it's, to it's study certainly those an interesting things. topic I, I, I yeah. definitely want to come back to that at some point um Okay, so where would be a good spot here to pick back up? Within so, our- so, so going back to the authority thing. So, I, I'm using sort of like me personally as a homeowner and as a father protecting my family versus being a private citizen and not a government is mm-hmm. a different level of authority to set up the example of God having the highest authority. So there's circumstances in which God can choose when life begins, when life ends, how long life is going to be, and all of that, because he is the creator and author of life. And so there are things which he may do, which I may not, right? If he chooses to strike down a man walking down the street with a heart attack and not do anything about that, that's his authority to do that. I'm not allowed to go up and stick somebody with some kind of, like, chemical solution which causes cardiac arrest and be like i guess it was just their time you well, know well, well, now, now i wait, don't though. have the so authority if, to do if that if god is the author of life wouldn't that be if, if you went and did that to someone that would have been god's decision right i it again like we're getting into primary versus secondary causes right so god is sovereign over all things but i'm going to be held responsible for murder as a sin and I can't just say, well, it was just their time, and so I'm just a, you know, I'm just the hand of yeah, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, this. I understand like, your your defense <laughs> against everybody else, you know, against other humans would obviously be useless. But in the grand scheme of things, because you were able to do that, doesn't that in some way, because we, we talked about this before, the sort of that everything that happens is you know, like you're saying, you know, God is the author of life. Yes. So, so, so no one is going to be like, if somebody murders me in, on the street in two and a half years, right? God isn't going to be like, oh my gosh, I had plans for him in his fifties. And now I, oh my, well, they're all gone. Oh no. Um, <laughs> that's, that's not how it works. Of course. Um, God's written out all our days before any of them ever were. And so you're right. Even things like the sinful acts of men are within the dictates of God's decrees as to what my life is going to be, if that makes sense. So that's that's some language we need to we need to look at. So the dictates of God's decree. Um, how far does that go um, in these discussions? How how far of how much of what everyone does is the dictate of God's decree? Well, God works all things according to his will. So, so that's in Ephesians 1. So, yes, all things. So do you not feel that that's problematic when it comes – because people can do immoral things, right? Yes. So if the immoral thing was part of the dictate of, of God's will, doesn't that – isn't that a little problematic? for you um so it's something that we need to take seriously and consider but it's consistent with what scripture reveals so so there's a couple of examples there's well there's multiple examples but um probably one of the more clear is um the story of joseph and his brothers um you're familiar enough with scripture to get to to remember i think maybe how what happened with Joseph? Yes. Yeah, he was um, taken where, into slavery. Yeah. Y- yes. Specifically sold into slavery by his brothers. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> at the uh, at the end of that 
sort of story as as uh, many years have gone by and he is now second to the rulership of Egypt and his brothers are standing before him and their father has died and they are fearing that now that their father who Joseph actually cared about is gone there's nothing standing between them and Joseph's wrath <laughs> um Joseph explains to them in the very last chapter of Genesis that you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so we have this within the same intention. You have that God restrained their evil because they sort of wanted to kill him, but they weren't allowed to do that. But what they were allowed to do was within God's plan to bring about the results that God had in mind to do. So this is one instance where we have a clear example of how God has a good intention in this happening. Now, we don't have laid out for us what God's good intention in behind every single evil act in all of creation is. We, ju we just, there's not enough paper to cover that. And so, so what we do know is what the Bible says, that God is good, that God controls all things according to his purpose, and that he has a good intentions in those things. And so maybe it could be that his desire is to bring about repentance in, in people who experience these things and and throw themselves on god's mercy or maybe it's just a matter of uh judgment or the fact that evil is being displayed so that the righteousness of god can be shown in contrast to that evil um we don't know all of the answers and those even those things that i said are just my own speculation right um but wait, wait, wait which that, part of what you said is your own speculation um i I would say what I'm doing is I'm kind of trying to draw from generally biblical principles to put together possible reasons. Like it talks about how the kindness of God is meant to bring us to repentance, but then also in Romans 9, it talks about um, what if God, um, you know, and before I try to misquote everything. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> give, me, uh, give me two seconds here. Um, but what if God, desiring to show his wrath and make his power known, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for our glory? So that's something that I have specifically. Um, and what I'm, what I'm sort of trying to piece together from that is that in some way, God being patient with evil people shows a makes known the riches of his glory to those who have his forgiveness. And so part of seeing the contrast between wickedness and righteousness means that we do live in a world that is full of wickedness. Um, and, and that's just part of the way that God has set things up for his purposes. And so can, can we say that it's wrong that God should have set up the world to, so that nobody experiences any bad things? Well, again, I'll point you back to what I started this conversation out with about what, where are we as humankind and what do we deserve and what do we have the ability to demand of God as far as our rights? Like, do we have the, the right to go to God and say, you have to give me at least 20 years on this earth? or else it's just not fair, right? Or at least 80, or at least 10. What's the number? Is there a number? Does it even make sense to make that kind of demand? Well, of course it doesn't, because again, if the Bible says the wages of sin is death and we are all sinners, then we don't have any right to complain about one person's life being shorter or longer than another person's, because any life that we have is already under the category of mercy, and not justice anyway. So to say that God is unjust because this person died or because this person had a bad thing happen to them that was not as bad as death, we're using the wrong categories to even start to ask that question. Mm. So when you talk about the, um, you know, that everything is, there's, there's going to be a good result to all these things everywhere forever. Right. You know, even even the immoral accident, we just can't understand it, um, that there's going to be some some kind of good result in it. So if if someone decides to go and, and shoot their neighbor, um, there's going to be a net good result out of that. 
because of whatever they're doing is part of God's edict and plan. Is that what I'm gathering? Um, not not that a, we could grasp it, but that's what we would have to assume, right? And, and keeping in mind that that good result is from God's perspective. It may not be good for the for the person who has died and <laughs> right, obviously, obviously God, yeah. right? Like, I, I, so my hesitancy isn't because I'm not sure that I can answer that question. Yes, because ultimately the answer is yes. I just want to be careful that we're that I'm not saying a yes in a way that's going to communicate something to you that I don't intend. If that makes sense. Um, because we might say, well, how is that good for that family? Might not be. Well, uh, yeah, God yeah, doesn't necessarily. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to come back and say, well, it wasn't good for that guy. You know, the, <laughs> obviously, I get yeah. what you're saying. The, the, the grand, there's some kind of grand scheme. That there's a there's a game plan here overall, and that that was the best way to achieve that goal. Somehow, the net result is going to be good from that. Um, yes, that that's the that's the general idea. So. To me, and I know I know I've brought this up in a lot of these other discussions, and it's it's one of the things that comes up every time I really think about or consider the role of the theistic God is that some way or another you have to arrive at, at that very assumption. You have to arrive at that because if if God is moral and if God has the ability to intervene and has the ability to to do all these things and it is an agency God, then you have to arrive at the assumption that, well, when all these wicked and evil things happen, there has to be a good result at the end that somehow this was necessary. <clears throat> and for me that, that creates a problem because the, the very act of, of suggesting that that's the case feels immoral to me. Um, because, you know, like you were saying, it's, it's, it all depends on how much of the information, you know, about a certain situation, you know, maybe we don't know all the facts surrounding an event and everything. And for me, that's always been problematic because we have to assume that that's the case. And then even when we see something we think that's the most wicked, the most evil thing the, the example that I use in the other videos, right? The, the guy in Tennessee and the, the girl um, that he abused um, so horribly is that this, I feel like any belief yet constructed of a theistic God leads you where you have to assume that this is the case. And to say, okay, because of my belief, I have to look at that case and say, somehow, some way, in the end, that is what had to happen. Now, if you say there's a better way to do it, then that makes God immoral because he didn't choose the best way to go about getting his plan. So this has to be the most moral way to achieve the, the grand final goal. This has to be the absolute best way to do it. And that, to me, just the act of suggesting it feels immoral. So... What's the based on what standard of morality then? It's ours, right? The the moral morality we're we have. It's right. the only moral but, it's the only morality anyone knows about. Nobody yeah, has any but, other. Understood. But I but I would argue that um our perspective on morality is bent and to the point of being broken because essentially um you know remember what I remember that passage in Romans three about the basic condition of humanity. Um, so in it, Romans three is sort of the capstone of a whole section in Romans one through three that really talks about human nature. Um, and in Romans one thirty two, it says, though they know God's righteous decree and those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. There's this tendency within those of us in the good old human race to look at the sins that we commit, especially our favorite ones, and say, you know what? That's not a big deal. In fact, I'm going to give approval. I'm going to celebrate the fact that other people are doing the same stuff that I'm doing. Then when we look at somebody that's doing something worse than us, we're like, 
bad, bad, bad. That's a bad person. I'm a good person. That's a bad person. But that's not the perspective that God's revealed to us that that is the reality. The reality is we're all bad. We're all sinners. And so to say, look, this bad thing happened to this good human, that's wrong. Wait a minute. There was no good human in that scenario. Right? You might say, oh, that little girl was innocent. But, but really, what does innocent mean? In the, in the scheme of humanity, there is nobody that's innocent. Well, that and girl I'm... was less than a year old. Okay. And so, and so you're suggesting that because that girl was less than a year old, that she deserved to not have anything bad happen to her? Is that, is that the, no, the no, moral no, but framework? We're, that you're... we're talking about the morality of the situation. Did the guy commit an mm -hmm. immoral act or not? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. And but you think But but is, you're is, saying is, that is, God has <clears throat> God has a moral obligation to prevent bad things from happening to good people. Let me well, well let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. And and I apologize if this sounds insulting. I don't I don't mean it to. I'm just trying to, to grasp the no, I understand. This is a this the, so, you have to you have to hit Hard with yeah, this topic. Yeah, it's, yeah and yeah, like I, I said, I, I don't mean this to sound insulting. I'm just trying to to understand this. When you talk about, you know, what does innocent mean and all that, do you not view the man as more sinful than the girl? I do. Absolutely do. Okay, yes. okay good, good. I, I like that to man, make sure that that man should be should be executed by the civil authorities for what he did. Okay, okay, just right? just, just make it like, short. Just making sure because I've I've spoken <laughs> like, with like people. not not even touching what God's going to do to him, um, like even even within even as a civil authority, we have a responsibility before God, according to God's law, to execute that person. Right, right. So because okay, he's I, so I, evil, like that's yeah. I, yeah. I, I just wanted to make sure because I've heard people say that before, and it's 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 really hard. Uh, yeah. No, I appreciate you asking that question because I okay. wouldn't want anyone to in any way misunderstand me. Okay. <laughs> but what I'm saying though, what I'm saying though is if if we're looking at a wrong thing was perpetrated on an innocent person, that's only ever happened once in all of history. And that was Jesus Christ who died who was wrongfully executed on a cross who never actually sinned. And so you don't you don't think that that girl was innocent? In the way that Christ was innocent? No, she was a sinner, just like every other instance of humanity other than Christ. Like, so and, for and, different. And as such, and as such, deserving of death. Yes, unfortunately, as part of the human condition, we are all deserving of death. Okay. So what happened there because of, of divine edicts and guidance and everything? Again, I, I want to go back to this because I want to make sure that we don't we don't uh, abandon it prematurely here. Um, we view if 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 we follow along the the types of morality that we've been constructing here based on the the theistic approach that you're taking, then we would say what happened to her is the most moral way to go about achieving the end game, the end goal that, that God has in mind. From God's perspective, from, yeah, not from, from, saying from God's that, perspective, what that yeah. not that it was the most moral thing that guy could have done that day. But if, we could, if we could see things just, just as a hypothetical, if we could see things from God's perspective, then you're saying that we would have to say then that, aha, this was, there was some sort of profound result from all this and that that was the most moral way to go about it. Because if there was another way to go about it that, that resulted in less suffering, then that would obviously be preferable and God would have chosen that way, right? Yeah, I, so, I would say I think that's a valid yeah, statement. Yeah, so, so we have to look at that case and say this was the most moral way to achieve God's goal in the end. And you know, again, that's that's one of the things that I I can't get past, and this is 
one of, and the reason why I wanted to discuss this, because this is one of the, the real core things that's standing between me and some form of theism is because that's, like I said, that's the sort, that's the, the assumption that you end up having to make is yeah. that all these wicked, immoral acts must therefore be the most moral way to go about all of this. Because if you don't, then you end up with the problem of, it's a, it's a big problem for me. And it's, you know, a, among all the other issues that I run into when I look at theism as a whole, that's the sort of the core. So the <clears throat> thing that I have to get past first before I could journey any farther into theism. And I can't, you know, so far I, I haven't, I haven't spoken with anyone that had a good, what, you know, a good moral answer to me for, for why this is this way. Um, because like I said, to me, just, just the act of saying that feels immoral. And I, that's gonna, I think forever push against, um, other than, you know, that there's, there's some forms of theism out there that don't do this, although they don't do it convincingly. I, I think when you, when people try to avoid this being the case, when you really push them on the theistic position, they end up having to say it in the end anyway. And that's, right. that's a point for you, obviously, compared to other theists, is that when you really push this point, this is the conclusion you have to arrive at, is that, you know, what happened to that girl had to be the absolute most moral thing to happen in that case in order to result in God's ultimate goal. And so, so here, here's what I would maybe point out here, because essentially when you're, when you're saying that it seems immoral to even suggest that what you're proposing is that there is a line at which a certain amount of suffering upon a certain group of people is too great for there to be any way of redeeming that or, or any sort of point to it. Like no point could, no point or no goal, no, nothing could possibly rise above that. Or at least we can't see any way of saying, oh, there's going to be a good thing that comes out of this. Yeah, no, no, um, I, I get that. I get, I, and, and I, I, I see the the importance of that. Is they're saying there, there's no net result that could possibly outweigh this act. Yeah, and that's but, true. And, that's true. But the, and, you, and let me just suggest something too. In in addition to that, that let's just say that there's like a line of evil that that God lets it fill up before He starts intervening, right? Because I would I would argue that God does restrain the evil of men. I, I believe the Bible does teach that he does that. Like he did that in the case of Joseph's brothers that wanted to kill him and they sold him into slavery instead, which was still evil, but not as evil as killing. <laughs> right, so, right. So, so, so there are, there is a restraining thing. And so like, as, as in our perspective, the restraint gets up to here and we're going like, wow, that's a lot of evil. But well, like, well, well, but now hang on. What there's, if the restraint was here? We'd be like, wow, that's still a lot of evil. But it's like, like we don't have any way of looking at like what God is preventing. We only see what God doesn't prevent, and then we say, wow, that's terrible. Why didn't God prevent that? Yeah, well, because yeah. he, he was preventing these things and not those things. If he were to prevent those things, then there'd be another level down here where we look at it like, wow, that's a lot of evil. Why didn't God prevent that? So like. By what right do we draw that line and tell God, you, you're drawing the line in the wrong place, man. You, you got it. Is it no evil at all? Well, we don't like that because then we'd all be dead. So, what, <laughs> you know, uh, if God stopped all evil before it happened, we would not wake up in the morning. So let's, you know, so so we have to draw that well, line well, somewhere. Now, now that, that wouldn't necessarily be the case because then the edict the the plan the author of life would be that we were moral beings god could do that right um i suppose that that's something that he theoretically could have done but he didn't 
but 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 he could. So I'm saying if if, if God wanted to, the, the scenario you're saying is if God wanted to wake up and have a moral species, he could. If he just wanted to disappear all of sin, I I don't know that he. At this I'll be point, careful there. Be could careful there. Because, <laughs> well, no, because because again, God is just and. In his justice, sin must be punished. So to just poof sin away and and not have any justice for it would be in itself against God's character. So God can't do anything that's contrary to his own character. So I guess it depends on what you mean, and this is getting into weird hypotheticals. The situation, yeah, yeah, no, I know. I, the I, the yeah. situation that we are in is that we are in a world that is full of sin and evil. And so... You know, we we have it's been revealed to us, you know, some in scripture, some of the reasons behind that and all that. But I think something else that we need to recognize that's really important is in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Except so, for morality, though, right? Because no, you, you were saying not at the beginning that, that our moral conscience is based on God's character. Our moral conscience is based on God's character, and in that situation of that little girl being abused, our moral conscience says that is wrong, and God's law says that's right, that's wrong, that guy should be taken out and executed. What he did was a sin, and we agree that that's a sin. But it so, was it was a it was a sin that had to happen. It was a sin that God allowed to happen. Yes, I mean it's part of God's decree that sin exists. Yeah. But I mean, it, so, it was it was not only allowed to happen. That was what had to happen, right? Because we're in the we're in the timeline. He's, if he's the author of all this, we're in the the timeline that must result in the most moral outcome. So that yeah. had to happen. I want to be. I want. I want to make a distinction here. Not that I'm saying no to what you're claiming, but I want to make an important distinction because sometimes people get this twisted. I don't want it to be misunderstood. So there's a difference between primary and secondary causes here. God did not take a good man and put in his heart, "You need to do this evil thing to this girl for my plan to work out." Okay. So like. When we talk about God's sovereignty, we're not saying that God, like, puppet mastered this guy who really wanted to be a nice guy and an upstanding citizen and then forced him to go and abuse this little girl. Okay? That man did what the evil desires of his heart told him that he wanted to do. Okay? Now, God could have restrained that evil and probably did. Did. Um, le- did. Because he didn't do that to more children than he did, right? So God in some way acted to restrain him from doing all the evil that he wanted to do. But we see the things that he didn't restrain, and that's kind of where we're looking at it from a certain perspective, where we say, God, why didn't you restrain more? Well, maybe he did restrain more. Well, I mean, um, so the, well, the problem with that is that there's, there's, there's other people in the world that have done extremely wicked things to a whole lot of kids. You know, the, Absolutely. So, um, and, and but there's it, not it, more of them that did. Sure, like again, cer- it, it certainly appears as though we can do the, however immoral someone wants to act. God's not going to stop them. That's certainly how uh, it, it, it it appears that from our perspective, because people do are doing what they want to do, and yet God says in His Word that He essentially, you know. Even the heart of the king is like a like a water course that flows wherever God steers it to flow. And then if you read through the book of Kings in the Old Testament, you realize that the hearts of most of those kings were really bad news. Um, and so, you know, God isn't the one that's putting those ev- that evil there, but he can steer and block and restrain and right. prevent things from happening so, so let's, let's but say, again he doesn't restrain all evil and he does that for whatever his purposes are which he doesn't always explain sometimes he does and but most of the time he doesn't right. so, so i can't give you a list of reasons why this happened to this particular person i'm just trying to give general principles of what we do yeah, know yeah, from what and, god has revealed and that's that's why i say the the, the angle from which i approach this is is that 
the idea to suggest if, you know, because God could have restrained this evil and not let this happen, right? Right. Absolutely. And we have to assume that since God's perfectly moral, that the outcome of all this is that if he did, it would be a less moral situation in the end. So this had to be allowed, right? If, right. if God had restrained that evil, which allowed that act, that the evil of that act, if he had restrained that, then that would have been the immoral outcome. And that comes right back to, to what I'm talking about. That makes that, that makes that situation and I, I don't, I wish I could, I probably what I'll do the next time I feel like I'm going to have a, a discussion on reality is I'll find another example because all, all three of these <laughs> discussions have come back to that one because that, it, to me in my life, that struck me as the most immoral thing that I've read about, heard, seen. Um, I didn't see it, obviously, but that I've read about or heard um, is this, what happened to this girl in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like I was saying before, and, and I hate to, to re, you know, repeat something that I, that I said a minute ago, but this is where I want to make sure that we exhaust this before we move on to the next topic. Yeah. Um, is that the, to your credit, I feel like any theist, when you really push them, if, if a theistic God exists and you keep pushing them along and saying, well, that this must be the case and this must be the case eventually they have no choice but to arrive at the same conclusion that you've arrived at. That what happened to her must be the most moral situation. Now, if my moral conscience doesn't agree with that, and combine with this, um, you were saying, your ways are not my ways, you know, the the passage you're reading about uh, God's nature. Isn't there a, to me there is, but I'm, I'm just going to ask, ask, ask your, your point here is if you say, you know, your ways are not my ways, but then you also say that our morality perfectly reflects God's. Are those not, are those two statements not themselves a little bit problematic to go together? They're, they're addressing different categories of thought. So let, let me try to explain in the way that God has, so when those of us in the Reformed camp who would believe in the sovereignty of God and are able to consistently address these issues. Just, um, just right quick, can you, can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Because I'm, yeah, I'm afraid yes, that, Reform, yeah. Reformed, for, for those that may not be as, as familiar, uh, we would believe in the sovereignty of God over all things. So in contrasting what some of the other people you were speaking with was they, they shied away from this idea, whereas I dive into it headfirst, um, that God is, is actually sovereign over all things and all events in time. Um, and so for those of us that embrace that, which is, I believe, what the Bible teaches and, and would be happy to demonstrate that with anyone who would disagree, um, we see a revealed will of God and a decree of God, which involves things that are contrary to his revealed will. Like God allows things to happen, which are inherently contrary to God's own revealed law, murders, abuses, and and whatnot. So when I talk about how we understand the character and nature of God, we see that like it is in God's character to not abuse that little girl, to value her life as a person that's been created in God's image, and to uphold and do right to her. And so that is what God's revealed will is, that God has commanded that man to treat her in that way. And it, because he violated that command, he is deserving of death. And I think, you know, everybody who, who uh, values the life of that little girl would say, would, would say, we agree with that. Um, that, would, that would be a good thing. Um, so we all admit that this 
is something that is wrong and we understand it to be wrong because we're created in the image of God and we have God's, at least to some degree, we think like God does about the immorality of that act. Now, where we see this concept of God's ways being higher than our ways and, and God's ways being different, when we come to this question, we start asking, but then why didn't God strike him dead when he first reached out his hand to touch this girl? Man, I would have loved to see that happen. I'd love to see lightning bolts taking out pedophiles on a daily basis. Um, but God hasn't chosen to do that. And as much as Jonathan would do that, <laughs> um, God has not chosen to do that. And, and at some level, I have to trust that God is a whole lot smarter than I am and a whole lot wiser than I am. And he has permitted even terrible things to happen. And my personal opinion is that I think God does this so that we can see just how sinful sin is and be repulsed by it so that we can say, wow, there is something horribly wrong with this world. There, there is something seriously the matter. And, and if God just all cleaned up all the bad stuff so that we couldn't see that, then, then I don't think we would understand the seriousness of our own sin as well. But again, I don't have any direct verse that teaches exactly that, but I think that that's at least one thing that is at least hinted to in certain places. And I could point to passages in Romans eight that talk about the creation being subjected to futility um, because of him who's subjected in hope and, and that, and the results of all that. And that may be going too far afield, but I think that where there is not a contradiction is that our moral conscience agrees with what God would say about what this man did to that girl and say, that was sinful that's wrong. He's going to face judgment from God about that. God isn't going to say, hey, you did a good job. That was the thing I told you to do. No, no, that is not how that's going to turn out. When he stands before God, he is going to experience the wrath of God for that act. But that was the most moral act to take place at the time. It was from God's perspective. I want to be careful. Yeah, it I know. I know. Because it's moral tricky, thing. Yeah. It was the most moral thing for God to permit that injustice and the amount of injustice at the level that that injustice is in this world, he has set that level for his purposes, for his good purposes. And that's uh -huh. the, in that right case, for him to do that. Right. And, and right? so in that case, that was the, because, you know, like I said, it would be immoral of him to not pick the most moral situation. So this, in this case, is the most moral way to go about achieving his ultimate goal. From God's perspective, right. Yeah. And, and that includes bringing about justice against the perpetrator of the immoral act. So I'm wondering then if, let's say you could, you know, look at someone's, this is impossible and this is obviously a hypothetical, but let's say you could look at someone's moral conscience and understand what it's saying to them. And they're trying to figure out whether or not to go kill their neighbors, you know, the, in the house next to them who have done nothing to deserve this. <laughs> Look at that. They've done nothing to deserve this. <laughs> right. And he's, he's trying to decide whether or not to go kill them. On, on the one hand, he could say, well, if I don't, I'm acting in accordance with my moral conscience. Then on the other hand, he could say, if I do, then it was the divine edict of God. And eventually this is going to play out to the better. And you could even say that this were a, a murder suicide scenario. If I kill all these people and shoot myself, it might result in my being in hell forever. But obviously that would then have been divine edict. And whatever happened there was the most moral thing that could have happened. As long as God doesn't stop me from doing it. This has to be the most moral act. Or the most moral way to get to the the result right there's nothing there's nothing about that scenario that would be in conflict with what you've been saying right uh, actually that's wicked reasoning the, <laughs> i'm just trying to follow which what this is no this no is no, the no direction I, the, the discussion's to, gone 
to be clear, for, for that man to, to say, I am going to break the revealed law of God, and I'm going to murder my neighbor, which God has explicitly commanded me not to do. Because if I did it, it must have been part of God's law. To, it must have been part of God's decree, so I'm going to go do that. That's wicked reasoning. But, that's but, that's but, evil but you're thought that, to do you, that. But you've said that immoral acts, no matter how immoral, are part of God's edict and result in God's positive outcome. But that doesn't give us the right to. No, of course, of course. I'm just that saying we... that, that that's two possible scenarios that the guy can consider. He can say, of course, it's immoral of me to do this. Of course, I'll end up in hell. But because yeah, if, of my if, beliefs, if he's that theologically sophisticated, then I would hope he would also recognize that um, he is mocking God by those actions. So, so by doing that, if he were to say, "Well, I'm going to go and and I'm going to go and commit evil because," um, well. <laughs> I mean, like literally in Romans 9, I, I already quoted a passage out of this, but um, Romans nine nineteen it says, You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Like the answer there is, who do you think you are? Y you don't get yeah. to, like, you don't get to play games with, God's decrees like that. You don't get right. to decide. It is God's decree that I go and kill my no, 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 neighbor. Yeah, yeah, that, that's not what I was saying. That, 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 right? Yeah, I wasn't saying that he was saying God told me to do it or, or anything like that. Let me let me look at it this way. Let's say that someone has done that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the person is in prison awaiting. Let's say he's in a state where that's going to put him to death. Yeah. And he really starts delving into the Bible and arrives at the conclusion that what he did was necessary in the eyes of God. Then he needs to delve more. No, well, I mean, this, the, obviously you, you would, you would agree with him. Obviously. I would, well, but, but, but I would say like, if, if you think in, in your reading of the Bible, sitting here facing death, that you're going to stand before God, and that's the conclusion that you're coming to. No, no, I'm not, yeah, I'm not plot, saying sir. he's going to use that as a defense oh or anything. <laughs> Obviously, he could still believe he's going to hell. But if he delve into the Bible and came to the same conclusions you did, then he would conclude that what he did was the, the most moral way to achieve God's ultimate plan. From God's perspective, but he would also recognize the deep immorality and the horrible sure, sin that sure, he's committed, sure, but, but and, he, would, and he could come feel to the, the weight of that. I would hope. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> but he could come to the conclusion that you have that whatever he did was what had to happen, the, the most moral way to go about getting God's final plan to come to fruition. That's but that's that all, would be that's of no comfort. To that, but I would hope that would be of no comfort to him because he would recognize that. Yeah, being I, I, a yeah. vessel that's going to glorify God through the demonstration of God's wrath upon him is not where he wants to be in this universe. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. I, I wasn't <laughs> I mean, saying anything I about how comforting. I was just saying that that's if he if he dove into the Bible with the the same uh, and and came to the same conclusions that you have, then that would be an unavoidable. Was that you know he's going to go to hell? What he was doing was immoral, all that kind of stuff. But that in the end, what he did was the most moral way to allow that God's will happen. And, and you could say the same thing. I, I don't think that the guy that did this act in Tennessee is dead. I think he's probably in jail. I don't know if he's in prison yet. I don't, I haven't followed up on the whole story, but um, yeah. you could say the same thing about them. If they arrived at the conclusion you have, which is. To but, you, but what's the point of that? Like it, it, for one thing, if they if they studied theology sufficiently and managed to ignore all the stuff about God's wrath and justice and only managed to glean that piece, then no, 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 no. I, I didn't say only that. I, I didn't but, say only that. I'm saying that that's so what's one, the point. I guess I, I I I didn't say that that was the only thing that they took away from it. I'm just saying that that's part of the conclusions that would come from understanding the Bible in the way that you have. And the, the only reason that I make that point is because that's the, um, 
again, you know, going back to what I was saying before, that's the that's the immoral side I, I, that I can't. That's that's the morality problem that I can't get through. That's the core of all that. But so, I feel like you're isolating it too much. Like when when you're saying, well, if we were to conclude that this was, from God's perspective, the most moral thing to do. Like, if, if there was some, a better thing to do, he would have prevented it. Obviously. So then we're right. going to, con- yeah. So then we're going to conclude that, well, God just must not have either known that it was happening or cared. Um, and, we, have and to assume, the, yeah, we have to assume that he knew that it was happening. We have to assume that he cared because that's the theistic God. And right. then we have to assume that, well, this was the, the most moral way to achieve God's goal. And, and and then, but but by you assuming that that is therefore immoral, you're just saying I flat out disagree with God that God can bring some kind of moral justified no, it, it, or it justifiably be, moral good out of this it, it evil wouldn't act. Be, to me, it wouldn't be disagreeing with God; it's disagreeing with that particular ideology. I, I'm not. So, I'm not disagreeing with God. I'm, I'm disagreeing with that conclusion. But but you're going but but I think what you're doing here is you're going from because this difficulty exists, therefore deism, and I'm not sure no, that no, no, I'm not saying therefore deism. I'm just saying this is the core of the problem that I have with theism. That isn't what led me to deism. So therefore, not de- not theism. In a way, yeah. Okay. Um, and so. You, the claim that you're making, and let me see if I can rephrase this in a way that, that boils it down to its essence here. The claim that you're making is that because immoral things happen, and because God allowed this immoral thing to happen, that therefore God must not be what he says he is? No. No. Okay. So, or, so. Or, 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 or God must, or the idea that God exists, that God is as the Bible says He is, can't be valid because of this I don't, apparent I don't know concern. That, I, I don't know that it's as necessary to 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 venture into the Bible just just to stay on the level of theism versus deism, um, because the theistic God, at least to me, now this this may be a definitional difference between the two of us, so mm-hmm. it's it's good to to visit this topic. So, excuse me, at least to me, the, the theistic God, if, if, if I say to you that the universe had an uncaused first cause, you would agree? Yes. Right. Then you go on to make many more claims. Um, and that's the nature of theism is to say, okay, I'm going to take that. I'm going to add all this other stuff. Um, with deism, it's it's for some. I don't I don't claim to speak for all deists here, and I certainly know that there are deists that disagree with me. Um, I've the reason that I've stuck with the sort of what I like to call, you know, if you watch those other videos, the the part that appears down here is it says the Thomas Paine method, which is the way that Thomas Paine discussed what deism was is the way that made the most sense to me. Um, in which he talked about the, he said that the only, the only thing that man can, I forget the exact language that he used, but the only idea that man can affix to God is that of a first cause. Anything beyond that, you're getting into trouble. You're, you're going to end up having problems in the long run. And to me, that's where the, the deism part ends. The theism part goes on beyond that. Um, so when it comes to me making a claim, the claim would be that if our moral conscience reflects the character of God, then that is, I'm, I'm trying to think of what's the right wording to use here. Um, Maybe incompatible is the word to use. It is incompatible with the nature of reality, of what we see. And the the thing here that sort of distills that out for me is this idea that that to me, making that assumption that 
what happened to this girl was the most moral thing that could have happened. That if God stopped it, that must somehow have been a more immoral situation. If God had stopped it. So this must be the most moral situation. That to me, I have a moral conscience that says that idea is immoral. That for me, again, you know, not I'm not trying to say this for anybody else. I'm just saying for me. I have a moral conscience that tells me believing that will hurt me. This is an immoral action. Mm. And when it comes to, like I said before, just suggesting it, that what happened to that girl must have happened, that that has to be the most moral thing to have happened. To me, it's for my own moral conscience, what's written on my heart rebels more than almost any other situation in that case. So then I come to the problem of, okay, my moral conscience must not be reflected by God. That if there's a moral God that exists, it's a different morality than mine, clearly. And I, and obviously that verse you pointed out would support that. My ways are not your ways. <laughs> you know? um, so, yeah, that in a way, that's the very on, hard... On some level. But again, I think, I think it's important to point out that you agree your moral conscience about what that man did to that girl agrees with what God's law says about what that man did to that girl. Right. Like, well, what all is including God's law? What scripture reveals like the, the penalty for that act is death in scripture explicitly. Are, are we sure? Yeah. I think, I think scripture could be made to say that. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it, does say that <laughs> it's not a it's not a be made to say that it's like well if, i mean you know if, you know th then we're then if we that man back. did that thing in ancient in israel under the under the law of god the civil law of god he would have been drug out and stoned by the community well well let's just let's, rocks let's, at make till it, dead. let's make it uh, a different situation let's say he's just killing the child same thing life for so life no one in the book ever was called told to kill a child. Well, again, now, now we're getting into the invasion stuff. Now you're, are, are you talking about where God brings judgment against a nation by wiping them out using a sword or some other, well, like let's, let's, either let's, a natural let's... disaster or an invasion or something else like that. I mean, and, and again, this gets back to where does God, um, where does God have to give everyone a certain number of years of life kind of question? And, yeah, and, so, and obviously you know, in this so, case, with the girl in Tennessee, he didn't have to give her any more years of life. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, as, I'll, I'll never morally, I, I don't see myself ever being able to morally accept that as a worldview. Um. And that's, again, you know, that's why I say that's the real core of all this is that morally, the universe we live in is certainly appears to be, and because that's all that I've got to go on, certainly mm -hmm. appears to be a universe in which if I decide to go kill a child that belongs to a neighbor, I can do so. Um, that no one's going to stop me. And... That puts the onus on us. We have to stop each other from doing that. If we want the world to be better, it's up to us. We're going to have to make the world better. Nobody else is going to do it. And um, like I said, at, at the core of the theism, deism step for me is that. And and I like I already acknowledged, that's a point for you when compared to other theists. Because you are readily admitting and affirming this. And there's theists out there that I've had four, five, six discussions with that refuse to acknowledge this. They just won't get there. And the reason they're doing this is because their moral conscience. Their moral conscience won't let them. They're like, no, I'm not going to do that because it's a wicked thing to say. <laughs> you know? And that's the whole, that to me, like I said, that's, that's a, that's a big issue for me. And um, because before I can take the step into 
okay, which theistic doctrine is true? Or which theistic doctrine is correct? I have to be able to make this step past that there is a theistic God. And that's the that's the heart of all of it. That's the the real core of all of this. So so what is it the so kind of going back to some of our previous discussions where I asked you what would be the level of evidence that you would need, I kind of gonna ask that same question here. What if we were to assume a theistic God in a hypothetical scenario for you, since you like those, what would the universe actually look like in, in terms of sin and, and evil acts and, and all of that? What, would there be no evil at all? Uh, would there be uh, well, there's, there's a there's limited amount of evil that's, that's a line that's not as bad as that line? Like, what are, well, the, what are you that, that then proposing? would depend... That would depend on how you define God, because as you know, there's Christians out there that say that, you know, that what happens tomorrow is not yet determined. That the the, no. the let's say God, God, as I believe him to be, what would be your expectation as the result of such a God existing? Well, as as far as his capabilities, his if, if sovereignty, a, his a, knowing of the future, and all that. Well, remember that. So, so this is this is the this is the result here. If a moral, intervening, observing, God, existed, that's watching things happen, that is moral, their self. Then I would not be able to take the life of that child, or would immediately be struck dead. When I went to do it. Okay. What about if you were to display unrighteous anger toward a child, to hurt a child emotionally? To emotionally? Yes. Emotional abuse. You yell at a child, you hurt their hearts with your words and with your tone, with your anger. The, is this the same child that we're talking I'm, I'm, I'm confused oh, what we're talking about I'm just I, I'm 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 lowering the bar to see where you draw the line so you wouldn't be able to kill that child would you be able to abuse that child emotionally well it depends on on what way you would approach the idea of you know us being able to determine our own future and well no we're talking about the the scenario in which God exists and God is the intervening God that that stands over all creation and is moral in himself and he's going to strike you dead if you kill that child so instead you emotionally abuse that child by with your words and with your voice so words and with my voice yeah you 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 yell at them you make them cry you, you they they are hurt by what you've done you you okay. call them wicked names that messes with their psyche well, there's, there's a few different ways to look at that. And I would say one way would be that you would be prevented from having that child, which would be that maybe you would, when, when trying to knock up that particular mother, you would be, God might then step in and make you infertile. That okay. would be one way to look at it. All right. So... How is life going to exist on this theoretical planet of yours? Well, because I mean, it, are, I, are you are you saying then that God could not make that happen? I'm I'm saying that essentially what you're doing here is you're saying because because any kind of sin or evil exists, therefore God can't be both good and intervening. Well, it, it's a, but it's then, a problem. But then, with, what's the basis of that? Claim? It's a problem with the with the divine edict theory. But uh, uh, just just to go back to it, because I want to make sure that we stay with this. Are you saying that God could not do that? That God could not what create a world that there was no evil in? Um, I suppose he could have, but that wasn't what he chose to do. So he he and okay. Now uh, this is important. Which is the more immoral action? To create a world in which there was no evil or to create a world in which there was evil? 
which is the more immoral action. I don't think that there is a more, I don't think this is a question of, is there a it's, more It's pretty moral... straightforward. It's, it, to me, anyway, it's, it seems pretty straightforward. If, if you're given the two options to create a world in which everyone is moral, which you admit is possible for God to do, and to create a world in which evil exists, which is also possible for God to do, which is the more moral decision? Just using your own heart. Because God isn't, because God is not, oh, I mean, it, it's, I mean, I'm using my heart and my brain at the same time here, trying to work through the question, make sure I'm, I'm giving a clear answer. Because essentially to say that it is in some way immoral to create a world in which his creation rebels against him, how does that impugn God? I'm not saying that it does. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm, okay. I'm asking you your opinion. So, so the, if it the is moral not conscience impugn- that you've been given, I want you to use that. The, well, the but, moral conscience that you but have. But I'm trying to understand. Like my moral conscience would say that if God did something evil, that would be a problem. But no, I, yeah, in I, what not, way does the fact that God's creation rebelled against God impugn God's morality? That's that's where I don't think I'm following no, yeah, you. Yeah, where you're saying so, it's less moral to create a universe in which God's creation rebelled against Him. How? I, I, I don't understand uh, just, why that uh, from a, lessens from a, God's From morality. a farther up view than that. I'm talking about from a, a farther out view than that. You've got two options which God must have if he's God. He's got two options. To create a universe with a world filled with moral people or a universe with a world filled with immoral people it's evil, wicked, all this. We have to assume from from your view that the more moral choice there is to create the immoral world filled with wicked people and evil. And again, I don't think... I want to be careful about what we're saying because we're not saying that God created a world and then shoved evil into it. We're saying that God created a good world in which his creation rebelled against him. Well, now, now did he know, did he know Adam from. was going to send or not? He did. So, okay, so that, that makes that point a little mute, doesn't it? No, because God is not the... God did not do evil. Could, not, could God not have created a world in which Adam did not sin? I guess he could have created a world in which Adam made no moral decisions. Um, no, 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 no. Now so. that's, 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 that's dodging. Okay, could, could God not have made a world in which Adam did not sin? If God did that, he would not have any way of displaying his justice. So... Again, are, are you saying you're, so? You're saying if God didn't create a world in which people could be immoral, He'd have no way to punish people. Justice being a divine attribute, I mean, I'm not just saying He needs to have a way of punishing people, but I think you're, I think what you're doing here is you're saying, well, how how is it that God so God creates this world in which He puts people that make a moral choice, but somehow He creates it in such a way that they don't choose to do evil, even though he created good people that can make moral choices that they chose to do evil, and so that's the situation we find ourselves in. So what's the point of this hypothetical? I'm not like, sure. This, I, we're, we're getting we got to this point yeah. in the discussion, and it's it's a very it's a very interesting point to to have gotten to. I, I didn't I didn't uh, but but to say that we would get to this right. So 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 here here's what I'm going to say. We're obviously not in this hypothetical universe wherein God created some... So you're asking me a lot of details about a situation which is so hypothetical just that one, I have I'm, no I'm, revelation. I'm just, I have I'm just no, asking... nothing that I can talk about what God would have done. I'm in just, this, uh, this is all, all I'm doing. Like Is asking you about your moral conscience written on your moral heart. Okay? If given the opportunity... To create a world in which evil exists, in which Adam's going to sin, in which all this suffering is going to result. 
Giving a choice between that and creating a world in which evil does not exist, in which Adam does not sin, and all this evil does not result. What does your own heart tell you is the better choice? And let's make it simpler than that. Uh, well, I don't know if it's simpler, <laughs> but let's let's just let's throw this off a little bit. This is an interesting uh, caveat. So let's say that the, the ultimate sin, could God not have made a world in which the the sin that damns all humanity was not committed until Adam and Eve's first generation of children. That they somehow committed this instead of Adam and Eve. Okay. It's just it's it's an interesting hypothetical. I just I just realized th- there's a lot of th- Again, I don't. I don't know. I I really don't know that it's useful to spend our time thinking about all of the different. Yeah, that's, you're introducing that's fair. thousands that's fair. of potential right. hypothetical yeah. worlds where you're, we have all these you're, different you're right, generations. You're right. and what so would let, the let, theology let, of a world be if, like, there were okay. yeah, sinless yeah, people and sinful it. people? Like, how would right. that work? I, you're right. You're right. I get what you're saying. Why are we having conversations? Yeah, you're right. You're right. So let's let's keep it on the the full elevated view. Okay. You've got two opportunities. To create a world in which evil exists, in which people will sin, in which all this suffering will happen. And then you've got creating a world in which evil does not exist, in which all this suffering will not happen. Filled with moral beings. All right. So so here here's here's what I'm going to present. And this, and this may not be satisfactory, but I think what we have in, and I want to make sure that we're fully describing both worlds appropriately, because... Essentially, what we have in the first world where there's no moral, either no moral decision or no moral failing for whatever reason um, that God created something different. Maybe Adam and Eve didn't quite have the same choices or didn't have the makeup where they had the ability to even choose to sin. So that brings up a whole of set of issues and and questions but essentially then the world just sort of goes on in a kind of there there that's it right god just created all this stuff and it's there and it and it goes on um however the world that god chose to create has obviously parts that we don't appreciate right the the moral evil that's, that's one way to um, put it. but but here's yeah <laughs> right so i i mean it's it's bad right there's lots of bad um however it also has redemption where god demonstrated is demonstrating not only his own justice but also his own self-sacrifice um to send his own son in the body of Christ to um, humble himself, to walk among his own creation, to suffer along with us, to be tempted in every way that we are except without sin, to be punished for our sin on the cross, and to redeem for himself a people that are going to be restored to a fellowship and unity with God, which is beyond what we even had in the initial creation. I think that that is the ultimate good that was the point of all of creation in the first place. And so I see the story of the gospel as being a beautiful, amazing, wonderful thing that glorifies God far more than that first sort of boring universe where nothing happens. And well, I well, get that well, there's... But, I mean, there's not really any right to say that it's boring, but I think I what you're saying. But where God, God does not demonstrate... God cannot show justice because there is no need. God cannot show um, any humility because there is no need. The sacrifice, self-sacrifice because there is no need. What's the point? Like, the, there is... So, for whatever reasons, God chose to create a universe in and an entire timeline, because I believe that God created all of time, in which he demonstrates his justice, his love, his mercy, his grace, all of which those things wouldn't exist in that other world. Like, there is none of that. There's no mercy or grace in a sinless 
perfect universe that never had any moral failings. And so we have these aspects of God's goodness and beauty and, and um, not just so that God can punish people, but so that God can show grace to those people that deserve punishment and redemption. I mean, I think that that's a beautiful and amazing thing. And so when I would say, I think it's more moral that God did what he did, it's not just because, well, God said so, so it must be that, and I have to say that. Wait, 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 wait. That, that's, that is sort of the result of, of your opinion was that, well, that's, that's what God decided. So I have to say that that's, well, that is part of your I position. Mean, but that's not, it, it might be part of my position at a base level, but that's not the reason that I'm saying that. I'm saying that because I believe the gospel is a beautiful, wonderful thing. Yeah. And, and what God did for us is a beautiful, amazing thing that we wouldn't have otherwise. And so, you know, while I can appreciate that um, it involves a world that has a lot of suffering as well, that in the end, God's going to balance the scales as far as justice goes, either in justice or in mercy through Christ, and that that's the world that we find ourselves in. And, you know, I mean, we can complain about how we don't like it, but Again, who are we to talk back to God at some but, point? But balance the scales. When you say when you say God's going to balance the scales, that's in in line with with your own moral conscience, right? If your own moral conscience tells you this was an immoral act, then God's going to in balance line with the what is right. In, in my conscience is not the standard. No, I mean, no, no. I, I I'm, I'm just saying vague... that that's 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 what we're using to say that in the end, all this stuff will be balanced out. So the the guy in in Tennessee we're using our own moral conscience to say, okay, what he did was immoral and he's, he's going to be punished. Yeah. I, th I think it's, and maybe this is something I should have addressed earlier. I think it's problematic to use our moral conscience as the ultimate standard of what is moral. Because when, when we start turning our moral conscience against God and start putting ourselves in the judgment seat over God and make him the defendant, then our moral conscience has started to demonstrate that it's no, 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 been no, no. twisted I'm not talking by about sin. Him the defendant. I'm put talking about ourselves the... in God's place. Yeah, I'm not taking talking about making him the defendant. I'm talking about making the guy in Tennessee the defendant. Well, and, and, saying... and in that case, God and and we have all the same judgment about that guy. He's but, wrong. But, but we so, but in that case, we would believe that our moral conscience matched God's. Yes. In, in that what that guy did was sinful and, and wrong. And we, and would, we would believe that my ways are not your ways doesn't apply there. Uh, what it applies to is where we might, in God's place, have smote that dude. God chose not to do that. And so we may not fully understand why and kind of would have wished that he would. Like, I know that he will. <laughs> um at, at some point, that guy is going to stand before God and have a very uncomfortable conversation about what he did to that little girl. All and, the while, though, knowing that not him himself, but you would know that what happened to her had to happen. But that's not going to in any way change the justice. The yeah, way but that's, the justice but that's, that's, that's the truth that of that position, though, is what I'm saying. That's... That's the truth okay, of that but, position. But, but why you seem to be presenting that in a way that somehow softens the justice that's landing in that person. No, no, no I'm, I'm, I'm not right. even. Considering, I don't know why we're not, not even considering the justice. I, 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 I'm, I'm just trying to circle back, you know, to because we're we're near the end of our time here. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to circle back to to what I was saying before was that the the position there, the theistic position, when you circle when you. When you look at that in the, you say, okay, yeah, he's going to get punished. He's going to go to hell and everything. And, but the and conclusion and that's is the that part, what he did had to happen. Yeah, that's the part where you say, I don't understand how this could be, how how God can bring good out of this situation or, or whatever. That's where we have to say, I well, may not see it, but God's yeah, ways are higher than yeah, mine. You, and you there's things assume, that I'm not going to understand. Yeah, you, so you have to assume if if you take that posture towards morality, then you have to say, okay, well, somehow that I don't understand, this is the most moral position. Somehow that God understands, but that I don't, this yeah. is the most moral thing that could happen. But why is that an unreasonable thing to assume? If God created the whole universe, he's obviously smarter than me. So I don't, I guess I, the, well, the it's, struggle it's, it's, there is, the, is. The reason that it's, the reason that it's problematic is this whole concept that 
God is a reflection of our moral conscience. Wait a second. God is not a reflection of our moral conscience. Okay, our okay, moral yeah, yeah. I may have used different, different language than you were talking about before. At but best, yeah. it's the reverse of that. <laughs> yeah, our, our moral conscience is a reflection of God. Yeah, but okay, again, yeah, it's yeah, a it's, reflection. It's, it's a reflection that's been colored and twisted by sin, and also by our own ignorance. Okay, so like, okay, okay. Wait, 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 wait. Let's 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 latch onto that. Okay, so my conclusion that what happened to her was wicked and if any way possible should be prevented and is not right, somehow this shouldn't have been stopped. That's a result of my own flawed, bent moral nature and wickedness. In, in that, the part of the part of the scenario where you pass judgment on this man for the evil work that the evil thing that he did. And you say that is wrong uh-huh. in that it parallels what God says about that scenario. It reflects that you are made in God's image and you recognize that evil where you use this as a jumping off point to say, and since God didn't prevent this somehow, then I am going to use this to reject the idea that God is as he is then that's where the the twisting comes around. Because ultimately, essentially, in Romans 1, it talks about how we know the God that exists, but we suppress the truth in unrighteousness because we love our own sin. And that's the moral problem that we've discussed about a lot before, where in our moral problem, we love to grab onto things that give us an excuse to be to continue in our rebellion against God, because if God isn't going to hold that man accountable for his actions, then God isn't going to hold us accountable for our actions either. And, and in our sinfulness, we much prefer a God like that. And so so, so, that's, that's the tendency that where, when you say, well, my conscience says God should have done this and he didn't, therefore God must be like this distant, thing that's far away and isn't going to interfere with my life i'm saying you what you're doing now is you're creating a god that's in an image that's convenient for you as per what romans one describes and that's a problem that's where your conscience is is bent in a direction that is toward rebellion against god like you know these acts are evil and you'll acknowledge these acts are evil but then on the other hand, you turn around and you use them to justify your own evil actions, as well, do but, all but, but there's, there's, there's more to that, though. I mean, it's, it's not that I know these acts are evil. It's when presented with the proposition that ultimately this was the most moral way to go about God's plan. That I'm just flawed for thinking that. That I'm just flawed for not being okay with the idea that this is the most moral way to achieve God's plan, right? Well, that's, but, that's but my, again, what's the, moral... what's the basis that you are saying God should have done something different or better? With our own, mor- the, the only moral conscience that any of us have. And, and so wh- where, where you start thinking, I know better than God does, that's because nope. your moral conscience nope. has been warped. Nope. It's not that I know better than God does. It has to do with the proposition that, God is allowing this to happen as the most immoral direction to allow the universe to go forward. I, I'm having That's a hard what time I have separating those with. things. Right. So, so help me, because you made the statement you made seems to me to be contradictory, and let me explain why so that you can help clarify. Because you said, I don't disagree with God's actions, but I can't believe that this is the most moral thing that God could have done. I think he could have done a more moral thing in different actions. How is okay? Okay, let me let me let me clarify. Let me clarify. Yeah, yeah. When Hope you can see where I'm when confronted with the claim mm-hmm. that this is the most moral way to go about the most moral conclusion to the universe. When confronted with that claim, that my rejection of it is the result of my own twisted, sinful heart. Because the basis of your rejection of that is that you think that God 
didn't do right, that he should have done other than he did. He should have stepped in and he didn't. And so he's morally culpable for failing to step in in that situation is essentially what you're the basis of your, your no, claim. no, it, it has to do with the claim itself. The, 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 claim how are you itself, separating the claim from, yeah, the, the, uh, just, just look at it this way. Someone claims that what happened to her, this, this, uh, this is a way to look at it because this claim doesn't involve God at all. Okay. Someone okay. claims what happened to her had to happen. And not only did it have to happen, that was the most moral way to go about it. To achieve the most good in the end game, even not even considering God in the claim, my moral conscience rejects that. And the proposition being put forward is that in that case, my moral conscience is wrong. That it's the result of our own sinful, immoral nature. Um, but we need to wrap up pretty soon. So let's let's try to get to some because I'm 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 worried that the the screen recording thing is going to error out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's try to get to some. Let's essentially treat this next few minutes here as like a wrap up thing. Um, All right. And then we can kind of wrap up where we're at and um, decide later if we want to do a, a part two. If there's a, a fruitful direction to go, what, what could we latch on to from here? to really dissect and, and open up in, in part two of the discussion. Um, I feel pretty positive about that. I've got my point across here. I'm, I'm hoping that I've defined it enough. And um, what, what am I, what's the words I'm trying to think of here? Um, I'm not sure, but <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that I've approached it from enough angles to, to get to the same position that you understand what's standing between me and theism. I'm mm -hmm. hoping that I define that well enough. So if there's a specific thing to latch onto that you, that you feel like would be fruitful to really open up in a, another discussion, or to open up in, in uh, some manner to, to really pursue what you feel is the, the most fruitful direction to go from there. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah. The, and so if you could just cover, if you, if you feel like my point is good enough and, and not, this will be the, this will be the, the problematic part. Don't try to define the problem that you see in my point. Mm hmm just try to, to understand and, and define what my position is and then say what would be the most fruitful direction to go from here. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think that given the objection that you're saying that God is, if God is moral and capable of intervening, and knows these things are going to happen, and then he fails to intervene. If that's the most moral, if that if that is the most moral way to deal with that situation, you have a seriously hard time accepting that. That seems to be unacceptable to you because, in your conscience, were you in God's place, essentially, you would have intervened. It, or, or th there's some. There's some basis maybe, and, and this is where maybe I'm missing what you're saying, because every time I try to take this next step about why is it morally unacceptable or why do you find that against your conscience, you're saying, well, no, it's not because of God's actions or no, it's not something else. But I haven't gotten a really good positive, like, what do you think God should have done differently? Or So I would like to maybe explore that some more. Um, and, and then maybe um, maybe explore more about the sufficient good that would come out of such a situation, and and what like does that have any bearing on this discussion at all? Because to say that this is the most moral thing is very repugnant to you, but then we haven't really discussed. But what if there was a morally sufficient good reason for this evil thing to happen 
like with Joseph's brothers, it was to say that Joseph being sold into slavery was the most moral thing that could have happened in that instance seems like a very repugnant thing to say until you read the rest of the story and recognize that like generations of history were impacted by Joseph's presence in that time, in that place. And so, you know, where do we draw the line and say, well, maybe that was actually the best moral decision or the best moral situation that could have happened, even though what the brothers did were evil. So even if we're not aware of those hypotheticals, is it possible that such a hypothetical could exist to where you would say, you know what, maybe my objection is too strong here. I think I would have to back off of that because there could be a morally justified reason for this. And maybe I'm not aware of it. And that's where I would say, but God is because his ways are higher than our ways. Right. So, you know, maybe, maybe exploring that a little bit more to understand the objection a little bit more would be helpful. That would be the direction that I could see this going in. There's probably other directions as well, but that would be kind of the, okay. Okay. the most logical direction, I think. Would it, would it be okay with you if I clarified a few things there before we stop the recording? Yeah. I don't, I don't want it to seem like I'm just trying to take the last word. I, so I just wanted to make sure that was okay with you. Um, We've had a lot of words. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. So, no, it's, it's, and I understand that this is, this is confusing that when it gets to, I had this issue with my first debate and the, uh, my first in-person debate, the, the one that I had with Daryl Giles. Um, he kept accusing me of, of, you know, in essence, putting God on trial, you know, who, what, what right do you have to say that God couldn't do these things and all that kind of stuff? And there was a big disconnect there because what I was saying was that when someone claims, okay, God, our, our morality is a re- reflection of God's nature. Now I'm going to claim that God committed an act that is in direct contradiction to your moral conscience the the problem that i have is the moral issue with that claim not with god it's just with that claim and to me that's that's what a lot of this comes down to is like that the position that well in the end what happened to that girl is going to play out and be the most moral to me is an immoral act to just say okay well Okay, what happened to that girl was in the end the most moral situation, the, the most moral thing that had to happen. That to me, my own conscience tells me that's an immoral act to believe what it, is? to say it. Can you clarify what you mean when you say that is an immoral act? What is the act that is immoral that you're referring to? Because it's Just, not what that man did to either, that girl. Either we agree believing on that. it, either believing it or saying it. To me, that that is an immoral belief, and it's an immoral statement. It's an immoral claim. Okay. The, it, it's the the act that that part, and that's what makes it different from saying, "Okay, I'm going to put God on my own moral scale," and and you know, that that claim itself is 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 what makes it immoral to me. Um, I, I, that but, would but be interesting I, I just wanted to, to dig into that. why, because that that would be a good thing. Because I I don't know that I did fully understand exactly that until this point, because I would be curious to see what is immoral about that claim, because okay. a, a claim in itself. Is just a it's a is a truth claim. It's if it, the only way it would be immoral is if it was unfactual. Okay, well, well, um, well let's so, let's so right, maybe right, right right quick. I'll give you an example. Okay, um, if someone looks at you know uh, um, the child of another person and says, okay, that child deserves to die, then whether it's before or after the child gets killed or dies or whatever, that's an immoral claim, even if that person doesn't kill the child saying that child deserves to die is something that that contradicts with my own moral conscience. Um, so that's that's what I'm saying. That's a the, just the claim is a wicked act. Not even not even looking at the act itself. Just the claim is 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 morally uh, problematic. But so when the Bible says the wages yeah. of sin is death, that's going to be a yeah, problem yeah, yeah. for you. <laughs> Of course, of okay. course, yeah. It's because, and it's because okay. that it, that's supposed to apply to even a newborn infant. That the wages of sin is death, and obviously that to me is is problematic. But let's um, let's stop it here, and then 
we'll we can decide if we're going to do a sequel discussion or, or another recording. Hopefully, this will this will cause some discussion, um, and hopefully, we can get too bogged down there. But I, I felt like we really needed to set on that question and really define it and really discuss it because for us, that's been the main thing is is that deism versus theism distinction. Um, so. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording, but we can continue talking after that. Um, but I'm going to stop recording in a second. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to come on here and, and, and have the discussion. And hopefully um, it may be likely. I don't know if I can use that word or not, but it may be likely that we do this again <laughs> later. I hope so. Um, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, and hopefully this will result in some discussion and um, hopefully some some more interesting uh dialogue but um i appreciate you coming on and hopefully we'll see you again next time yeah and i appreciate you uh giving me the opportunity it's uh it's always enjoyable to uh have these back and forth so it's great yeah all right i appreciate it. i'm gonna stop recording now